Hi, I'm a little late today. Sorry. Um, I'll explain in a second. But as always, I have to wait for the picture to come up so I can leap forward and mute. And let's see if I can do it seamlessly this time. Hi. Can I? Okay, pretty good. Um, so I was having a little computer trauma right as actually iPhone trauma, right as we went live. Um, and I'm still paranoid about this chat not working. So I'm going to get it started again by saying hi, all. Oh, this time it worked. Oh, yay. So whatever weird glitch that's been going on with the chat not loading seems to be uh, good because uh, Shannon's already here. Tony's already here. Tony, you're like the first one here every time. You are the world's most punctual um, attendee. So hold on. I'm just going to get this set up over here. Okay. Um, so the craziest thing happened with my phone right before we went live. I looked down at my phone and it said 941. And I checked. So for, first, I thought, oh, my God, is it 941? <laughs> like, did, did I wake up at midnight? I was really confused because I confuse easily. Um, so then I checked my preferences, and it was set correctly. And then it just, I don't know, changed. I, I, as you well know, I hate technology with a burning red hot passion. Um, plus, my brain's a little fried because you also probably know we are like 48 hours away from the launch of the new site and the new video sweater class. So I'm Gramercy Park. So I'm um, up to my eyeballs. But anyway, um, hello, everyone's coming in. Hello from Minnesota. And uh, oh, New York City's in the house. How's my city? Um, and speaking of New York, it's been an exciting time for the oldies, meaning me. Or, or the moderately oldies, I guess. I've been jealous of the oldies like my husband. Um, but for those of you in New York, the vaccine eligibility just changed to 50 and up. So I logged in like right away and I nabbed an appointment for um, April 27th. I nabbed it even though it's far away from now. So I'm gonna keep checking to see if I can get something earlier. Um, but. I'm pretty excited about that. Oh, from a very gray Dublin. Hi, Allie. You know what? It's a very gray New York. But the craziest thing is tomorrow it's going to be sunny and wait for it. 75 degrees Fahrenheit, which I always forget what that is. And in, in, as my friend says, real temperature. Um, but it's warm. Uh, oh, it doesn't say on the app what that means in real temperature. Well, I'll ask Carol. Um, anyway, so most of you guys are here and I'll do that thing that I always forget to do. Hi, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like button if you enjoy. Um, so I'm really excited. Uh, this is going to be my last guest for a little bit because in, in a couple of weeks, it's just going to be me because I'm going to be... Um, doing a whole live talking about Gramercy Park and the new education site. And then I'm going to have to do some reassessment about the frequency. Um, I might be able to stick to every other week, but um, there's a lot going on, which I can't really tell you about now, but I'm really close to being able to tell you. Um, I'm in the final negotiations and I'm just always a little paranoid until things are signed to tell you. Um, but anyway, oh, Marilyn, congratulations. Got a first vaccine this morning. Oh, Tony's getting vaccine tomorrow. Oh, this is all very exciting. So anyway, we have a guest from far away, which is why I think maybe we have some folks from Ireland here today. Because <laughs> I noticed like when I have Kate, when I had Kate Atherley or Fiona, like the Canadian guests count went up pretty high. So it's very possible that you're not here to see me and that is okay because um, I'm probably as big a fan of my guests today as you all are, um, which I'll tell you about in a second. I've been, I, I've been stalking her designs for many years and, and um, I, I wanted to show her yarn that I actually have for one of her patterns. But anyway, 
Um, I'm so excited to have our special guest from the beautiful Emerald Isle, the one, the only, the lady of stolen stitches, which I want to ask her where that name came from. <gasps> Carol Feller. Wow, the crowd goes wild. Hey. Hello. <laughs> Have I got myself turned on properly? You can hear me okay? I can hear you beautifully. Good. Now, good. I've never asked you your company name, Stolen Stitches. Yes. Why, where? Well, as with most of the names type of my business, it's mainly from my husband because he loves picking names. I'm a disaster. Like even for pattern names or yarn names, I can't, I just can't do it. So I hate it. I will do, I'll say, it makes me think of this. And then he'll free associate and I'm like, oh, that's the one. So that's mm -hmm. where most of my names come from. And Stolen Stitches is the same. It was because I started the business or I started designing when the kids were very small. And so we were looking for a name for the website. And he's, it was actually the first pattern we came up in Nitty and we're like, I really should have a website. And so we was kind of trying to pull a name at that point. It's like, look, all of your knitting moments are stolen moments because it's a few minutes here between you know school pickups or when the kids gone to bed and things like that. So stolen stitches, it became, and it's stuck for, gosh, it's 14 years, I suppose now. It's it, since I started, like my first design came out probably. Time goes very quickly. It is, it, I'm, I'm always afraid to look back on, you know, to, through your designs and see the dates on the first ones. Cause you're like, it can't, it can't be that long really. Um, it's a little startling, I think. And do you, I was talking about this with Fiona um, a couple of weeks ago about designs, uh, early designs that I, um, of mine that I disagree with some of what I did and I'm going to, uh, and some of them you just let go and let God, like it's old, no one knits it anymore anyway, it was published mm -hmm. for a magazine, but we were talking about how magazine like I was a good little rule follower when I used to work for magazines so I used the CYC standards which I no longer agree with mm -hmm. and so you know I'm going to go back and tweak have you ever re-released something that you have changed yeah yeah and, and and actually the rule of thumb you're talking about is often the criteria that I end up kind of using it to decide it because if it's something that was never really particularly popular a lot of people have initiated I'm kind of like I'm just going to retire it it's not going to make any money it's not worth the time to put into it if it's something I love and I'm getting a lot of requests for then I sometimes will go in and I'm and obviously, like very often, it ends up being that you expand the sizes. But yeah. what I find more so than like designs going going out of favor is um, the way I write patterns has evolved a lot in fourteen years. Because you know, when you when you start oh, off, oh yeah, though I that's the what I find the biggest difference is that things because I often my my head often got ahead of my pattern writing ability at the beginning is the best way to put it where I look at the designs that I like I I'd say oh I'm going to go knit this and when you're a new designer it doesn't you don't stop to say can I grade that can I easily yeah. write the pattern oh that's fine we, that's <laughs> we were talking about that last episode um yeah about how and, and I'm often very, that's the I'm very grateful that that was drummed into my head early on as a designer to censor yeah. myself early to make yeah. sure it's gradable. Cause I never designed on the needles. I only ever designed on paper, hit print and then knit it. Yeah. But yeah, that's I've really done both ways. And, and I think that, cause I, I had a couple of ones that were just me knitting going, oh, this is great. And then I'm trying to put it together. And the pattern, when I look at it now, I'm like, even going back, I'm like, there's no real way to write this pattern. It just doesn't make any sense. <laughs> and they're the ones I retire because I know it doesn't work anymore. But it was actually magazines that really helped me, I think, hone pattern writing. That me it's too. you're following a tech editor. You realize that even though you might think you know what you're doing, you don't have a clue until you actually are put through your paces a few times, you know. You learn quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, that we, we talked about that last episode about how I had a few early tech editors that really helped me understand, like I, I said last week that there were last episode about this one tech editor saying, I really respect that you're trying to be true to every size, but every single shoulder shaping for every size doesn't have to be a different number of stitches. Can you find a few that are in common because your pattern is longer than it needs to be. And, yeah. and length is intimidating and makes people go, oh, this looks hard. Yeah. 
I think I remember now seeing something you wrote just recently now that you say it on Instagram or some other place, like a little live you shared where you talked about some pattern that was tweaked it, it, you were, you found a better way to explain oh, yeah, how to yeah, do yeah. something. Yeah. It was the, the Woodburn cardigan. Yes. And it was, yeah. And I, and I think a lot of the problems and difficulties I run into is because I do so many seamless knits because it does make the pattern writing much more complex. So complicated. Yeah. Um, and that one was the Elizabeth Zimmerman saddle sh- um, seamless sh- saddle shoulder where, you know, you do the body and the sleeves in one piece and then you join it and you decrease the body, then you decrease the sleeves, but use the same seam line. And then you end up with the saddle doing like a, a heel where you go back and forth, decreasing each size. Right. It's a, it's looks lovely. I mean, the actual shoulder it creates and the shape is really nice, particularly for that kind of grandfathery style cardigan. But because there's so many things going on, like you've got, if you're moving these stitches around, you're doing the neckline shaping. And, and so you're doing this and do this at the same time and do and like, okay, people are not going to do three things at the same time. Two, right. fair enough. Three, you're at, it's too much. So I just ended up I expanding had a that out. Once tell me that, say that exact sentence to me. She said, I'll allow you two, but not three. Yep. Yeah. And I think that's the way to go that, and particularly one of them, like neck shaping, people are used to kind of putting that in with something else. Cause if you had to write the entire neck shaping out, it's going to be really long, <laughs> Yeah, but it's I always a, a trade-off, isn't it? It's, you know, between ease of use and yeah, totally. introducing complexity that doesn't need to be there. And there, there's a design of mine that I might throw away the pattern. Cause I always tell people like a pattern is not a design. A design is like that stitch pattern, that silhouette, et cetera, uh, th- where the pattern, how I went about it is so complicated. Mm-hmm. And it does have a three at the same time that I think I'll, I'll um, tweak it. Oh, Pam yeah. just said, Carol gave me the courage to cut my knitting, had a sweater that I knit when, when I was heavier and it was like a sack. Oh, do, oh, is that because of the, did, was that a class you, you had on altering? Yeah. Yeah. On, it was, it was on um, Craftsy, which of course that. wasn't Craftsy and it's Craftsy again. <laughs> yeah. Oh. And it's, I assume it's still up there because I, I haven't really even looked at the site in a long time, but it was, um, it was like sweater surgery class and yes, it was fun. I it was such that. a fun one to do because I did it with Stephanie Chappelle. And like, you probably know her fairly well sure. also. And she oh, yeah. is just, I like, she's a lot of fun. So we're like, we could do this and we could do this. And for the class, I actually got people to send me in their sweaters that didn't work. I had like dozens of sweaters. And so a friend of mine, the two, what know. we basically did is we spent a day chopping up and sewing sweaters. <laughs> it was wonderful. I guess I just assumed like, man, she had to knit a lot of stuff. No, that. no, people sent in their disasters. Tell me what was wrong with them. And it was actually perfect because you had all of these examples and different kind of problems people came up with. Um, and then we just, and then Craftsy sent them all back to the people afterwards. That is pure genius. <laughs> oh, and by the way, someone came, I just saw a comment um, of an excited knitter who didn't know you were going to be here. Where is it? Um, where'd she go? Oh yeah, Susan says, yay, I didn't know Carol Bell was here for today. <laughs> I love the tab- her tabbouleh pattern. Oh, oh, I don't know that one. Tabbouleh is the one that won I the March it. Mayhem a couple of years ago with- um, I do know it. I was going to say Mason Dixon knitting this modern day. Modern day knitting. knitting. <laughs> MDK. Yeah. Yeah. I but yeah, that. yeah, that was that. I remember that was particularly funny because that all started coming up to Edinburgh Yarn Festival a couple of years ago. And you know, the way I kind of the year before it had gotten into the first few ones. And then so you're like, oh yeah, you got, and then it kind of dropped out. So I was ignoring this one. And as we were doing it, it was getting further and further along. And I was all of these people really excited at Edinburgh. And I'm like, what are you getting excited about? And I had a whole group of knitters here in Cork on the day that the um, that the finals came out and they were getting so pumped. They were like, they're like, oh, my God, we're going to find out tomorrow whether you won. And I said, don't be stupid. I'm not going to win. I, I was 110 percent convinced it wasn't going to win. And I thought someone was pulling my leg when they actually uh, they say, hey, look, it's up. <laughs> well, so, yeah, that was one of the biggest the surprises. Though. 
Hmm? That's, I said, I've never even made the bracket. So God bless you. That is a, that's a huge accomplishment to even make it once, let alone make it more than once and then win. <laughs> it was, it was pretty cool. I, I, I think in terms of things I'm proud of, I'll put that way up there because it's, yeah. you know, one of those people choice ones, which it makes it extra special. I think, you know, as opposed to being just a small few people saying, oh yes, we're going to like this. And it, it, yeah, that, that did make me happy. Now you know, here's my people's choice of Carol Feller. Um, you, as you, as you probably remember, I was, um, I, I fangirled out a little when I saw your name on my purchase list for the Roselle T. I couldn't believe a, a you know designer that I admire so much like purchased one of my patterns and I, I emailed you and I was like you could have just asked for it for free. And you're like no 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 I love supporting other designers. I I really like to look at other people's patterns. So you kind of empowered me um, to purchase the one that I that's uh, nice. had been that's so my jam. That's the sugar cane. And it's really my jam. It's the shape that I like. Um, and I haven't knit it yet because like you, I'm always working, mm -hmm. but I have this yarn and it's discontinued. So I can't design on it. It's um, Anzula Oasis and oh, it is nice. a camel silk blend. Well, oh, that'll be lovely. And I think it'll be really good for that. I think yeah. it has enough memory but the drape of the silk, but the, you know, with the camel, I think I have a little bit of memory. So it won't just be like a floopy shapeless mess. Um, but so I brought this yarn up here because I foolishly thought before a couple things recently happened that changed everything that I would start doing pleasure knitting in the evening. So that did not work out, but I have decided I'm, I'm set a June deadline for myself for evenings, maybe not every night. Cause I am mostly working in the night, but like mm -hmm. a couple of nights or maybe a weekend. Yeah. Do you ever do pleasure knitting? Like um, things well, that don't well, generate income, just like, I just want to do it. Uh, yes. And no, what I've started doing lately is, um, re -knitting. Uh, Reknitting stuff, kind of looking at new yarns or th things like that, or a different color, and and I I think it's because sometimes I don't want to design. It's like my brain is it's like just this year, as yes. with everyone else, my brain has just I want to physically be moving my hands, but I just don't have the mental capacity sometimes to design, and so I've started just reknitting stuff. Um, like whether really it's if I want to tweak something or very often, like because I've started doing a few yarns, I want to show another yarn, like in things like a sock or the the, um, the club I'm doing lately has been perfect for that because part of the club we're doing blanket swatches. And so oh, there's some garter swatches. And I've been referring to them as my as as my palette cleansers. I'm like, OK, oh, God, I need to, I really want to knit tonight. I don't want to think, ah, garter swatch. <laughs> That is such a good idea because um, sadly, I, I used to be a big fan of classic elite yarn yeah. and I, a lot of my designs are in classic elite yeah. and um, you know, I'm super sad. Now you and I know <laughs> the way the yarn industry works is there's only so many mills in the world. Mm -hmm. And the secret is often multiple yarn companies really have the same yarn, but yeah. some of classic elite yarns were incredibly specific mm -hmm. and have yet to be picked up by uh, that yarn from the mill. But one of my favorites of an old classical elite yarn has been picked up uh -huh. um, and it's going to be my, my fall. Um, that's what I'm using for my fall Excellent. video sweater class. But I have a lot of other yarns that are hard to sub and not, and that's a really good idea. Yeah, and it's and it's it kind of, to me it kind of fills both criteria of it's relaxing and it's not thinking knitting because sometimes you just want to be knitting, but it's still kind of useful because you've still got an extra sample and it's your own work. So I've been doing that a little bit more lately, whereby it's it kind of it satisfies That's two itches, genius. so to speak. Yeah. <laughs> now I was going to ask you how how did you transition into well a what how did the whole yarn line come to be and how did like what made you do it? And then let's just talk about pure ignorance. I understand how yarn companies go about sourcing yarn from a mill and because mm -hmm. I used to work for a yarn company, but I don't really know, like, how does an individual person go? Hmm, I think I want my own yarn. Like, how did that all work? 
as with almost everything, what I've been doing with this is accidentally is usually the time <laughs> is because it, it was, as you probably remember from TNA, um, Fiber Spates is, yeah. is the distributor of my books and of my patterns. And I suppose it was about five years ago, um, Rachel uh, Koopy from Koopnitz, uh, she started the Socks Yeah line. And she, it was being launched at TNNA. And I remember sitting there with the two of them going, oh, I'm really jealous. I'd love a yarn. And Jenny looks at me and she's like, we can do a yarn. I'm like, really, Jenny? She's like, yeah, sure. What do you want? <laughs> and that was literally how it started. And so the following, I suppose, like, I kind of thought it was half a joke at the time. I didn't really follow up with it. And then the following spring, they were over um, Andy, who's um, her, uh, used to be her partner. They were business partners. They're married now. Um, they came over here and were doing a tour of Ireland. And he brought a big sack with yarn samples and said, OK, do you like the looks of any of these? And then he started throwing ideas out. And he threw the idea of the blend out. And I said, that sounds really good. So and good. because I was coming in as a designer, I knew what I wanted to knit with. So like I almost always knit with sports weight yarn. Like for sweaters, it was one of my go to. So and it's really rare over here. So I said, I want sports weight. And then my other criteria was, I said, for garments, I find that superwash isn't great. It doesn't tend to hold the shape. Right. So I said, I don't want superwash, which he was kind of balking at. And I said, no, I really don't want superwash. It's too it's, slippy it's like, for garments. It has such a satisfying toothiness, your yarn. <laughs> yeah. And so they, they were my criteria. And then he threw the rest in and the colors were where we kind of had fun. Because oh, I put I put the palette together, kind of my, it, it ended up being two parts because I had my, okay, I want the the basics kind of fairly neutral colors that I know I like to wear and I like to knit with and then ones that will complement with that kind of like the color pops and kind of favorite colors so they, that was it kind of started as two separate ones that could be blended in together but what kind of ended up defining the whole thing is the yak because the yak is the, the bare necessities is this real beigey color so everything's over dyed with that so it really really oh. changed the nature of the yarn then in the newer yarn you know um so Which that also yeah makes but, it makes the whole color line so cohesive exactly i yeah. love that that i love the idea that if if you wanted to uh grab a bunch of different things you kind of can't go wrong yeah. in the mixing of like, oh, I want to do a, add a little color work yoke, or I want to add a little. I love that. I I, yeah. I think Betsy was really good about that in Classical Elite too. That's one of the things I admired about that is when you think of a color story. Yeah, and yeah. you stick to that rather than trying to be everything to everybody. Yeah, and you're forced to when you start off with something that is got a beige a base. Like I'm looking at the sweater you're wearing, like it's even just a slightly lighter tone than that is what the neutral color is. So there's certain things you're just never going to be able to do with the colors. Like you're not going to get a white. People will say, "Can I get a white?" No, you really can't. Right. It's like doesn't come in white. I'm sorry. <laughs> and 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 the linen means that there's always going to be kind of a flecky tweedy. Uh, degree going through it particularly with the darker colors because it just the linen dye is totally different from the rest of it so the, the the fibers i think kind of define the way the yarn looks um, okay, to a certain name. extent where'd that come from nua is well it's a little bit redundant because <laughs> nua in irish means new so everyone like here come take a look at my new yarn nua and i'm like it's a, it's a little <laughs> bit of doubling up there <laughs> <laughs> like when you're in a restaurant and the waiter comes over and says, um, uh, so I want to let you know the specials and the soup du jour today. Yeah. Or and, and much, is, you don't think about it unless you actually are used to using the two languages. You don't hear it. I'm like, and then you stop and you go, hang on a second. Right. <laughs> or like no, a, no a, Irish a, people mocked me in the making of my yarn. So, you know, <laughs> we have, um, you know, for, for, cash machines, you have your PIN, which stands mm -hmm. for personal identification number. And it drives my husband crazy when people ask for their, you know, do you PIN know number. your PIN number? <laughs> you mean my personal identification number number? Yes, I do. <laughs> the thing with those though, the meanings of things get lost so often it, it, with use when it's being contracted for that long. 90% of people using it probably have no idea where, where the origin of, or have never thought about it, you know? Right. Like you can we, tell I him he's to... just showing his age that he knows where it originated from. <laughs> I used to work on, um, back in my old life when I was a stage manager, I used to work on the committee 
uh, for my union that negotiated contracts. And I just always killed me when we got to per diem and we would be negotiating the weekly per diem. <laughs> Your weekly amount per day. Okay, we'll just go with that. Yeah. Now, speaking of color, I had a question. Um, uh, and this relates to the Instagram post that I put on, up about the, uh, the Irish myth, which, which was quite um, controversial because mm -hmm. um, there are some people that swear by it. And I think it's because that myth of the, the reason people designed certain stitch patterns in Aaron knitting was so that their family had a unique stitch pattern and the bodies of dead fishermen could be identified by it. Now, I, I, I was have certainly to... heard that and read yeah. that in a million American. Yeah, but when well. you think about it and about how heavy cable knitting is, why would you wear that out on a boat? It would drown you in itself as soon as it got wet. I mean, it's just going to drag you under. And who wears fancy sweaters out fishing? It doesn't happen. It's basic, simple sweaters is what you wear, not something fancy. I mean, <laughs> well, do, do you know? So I went to um, when I went to the Aran Islands mm -hmm. and I went to the Heritage Center. Um, they have you ever been to the Heritage Center on the Aran Islands? Uh, I have. It's been a while, though. I need to go back there. It's been it's been quite a while. And this was ages ago. It was mm -hmm. ages ago. So I'm sure it's even different. But they did a spectacular job with all the tourists. Um, and this was what reminded me, speaking of color, to really make sure that we understood and learned something. So this woman, she gave a presentation and she brought out three sweaters. There was, uh, you know, the beigey natural color. A oh, four sweaters, sorry, black, a beautiful red and a green. And she said, okay, now who can pick out the traditional Aaron sweater? And you might guess what all the Americans pointed to was the natural color. Mm -hmm. And she said, no, it was the green and the red. And she explained the history of how it was when it, they were machine knit and it made the commercial transition to importing to America, mm -hmm. that it became the beige yarn that we think, the natural color yarn that we think of as a classic Aaron. Uh, and then she, uh, 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 someone said, now, is it true that fishermen, and she went, no. <laughs> and she said, oh, sorry, finish your sentence, finish your question. <laughs> and, she, and she asked it and, and then she said, no total myth and she explained where it came from which is so wild do you do you know the story of where this myth started i've heard one story but i'm very curious what she said to you so it's from a book and then also a movie which is so which a it was referring to a sock not a sweater knit in stockinette mm -hmm. that had a dropped stitch tacked down so in, in, in the book, there was a drowned fisherman. There were several drowned fishermen and she identified her husband or son. Oh, I think son by his socks. And she said, see, there are the four stitches, but I dropped, I dropped one and it's tacked down. And that became Aaron sweaters. I had never heard that. Although, I mean, the part, like the, the, the section of the story that, that I'm supposed most aware of is, um, back in the 50s, when they actually did become popular in the States, it was actually very strongly encouraged by the Irish government because the Aran Islands were so poor that it was a huge source of income. And I mean, since then, and you're probably aware of that when you were over there, the fact that like the, the women who were knitting the sweaters, they're very protective of their stitch patterns because they keep them all in their head and they know them really well and they do view them as their stitch patterns but not for the historic reason that ended up being created. But like no one dissuaded all of the myths because they sold more sweaters. So why would you, right? It's like- <laughs> Yes, there was a great story about um, how, I, now I can't, shoot, I can't remember which American fashion house, that they are actually responsible for starting a lot of the myths. Like that if you're an Irish American, you'll be able to, able to go to Ireland and find your Aaron pattern, your crest. And so 
to this day, people go to the Heritage Center looking at the wall for like their family pattern and they have to, you know, say, oh, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, and it's, I, I, and a lot of stuff, the way you put it, it grows legs very easily. And it's like, yeah, go for it. But I, when you actually do stop and think about it and about the fact that if you're talking about workwear, like usually in terms of stuff like that and myths, and you have to go back and like, why, what would, what's most likely to be used? Is it going, for practical use, you're not going to wear something fancy and white out fishing? <laughs> But like I hadn't actually heard that about the different colors, and I suspect part of that was probably to cover the dirt. Um, well, they they showed um, we learned about you know lichen about the kids mm -hmm. would go out and they would scrape the lichen, and so and and you know that the, the beautiful color that it became and cooking the dye and the pasta and everything, but yeah. that uh, that was too expensive for an export. Yeah. yeah. So the machine that's just oh, natural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, and um, and the thing is that um, like the like the natural yarns in Ireland, it would be known as bonine sweaters because in Irish, bon means white and then een is little bit. So cream is in like a little bit white, is, which is where, what's the word the bonine means. So I love that. Do, do, I mean, the, the, now I'm going to sound like such a stupid American, but do you know the television show Dairy Girls? Yes. Oh my God. The funniest scene in Dairy Girls was when um, they're, they were trying to get out their aggressions. They were trying to like, um, I can't remember. They had, oh, it was a teacher encouraged them to um, throw something while they yelled the thing that bothered them. They like to, and the one British character, the boy, um, his thing was calling everything we even when it's not small. <laughs> <laughs> and that's very much that's only northern ireland you never get that in the south of the country and i even find it really interesting with, with uh, the fact that it's it's such a northern irish thing it's like everything is we but i mean scotland is the same thing and like northern ireland and scotland have a lot yeah. of crossovers and i hadn't because we all learn irish we don't call it um what you uh, we call it Irish in school. This is, it's the Irish language. Are you it's learning supposed, Irish rather it's than Gaelic? Gaelic, which we yeah. say in the States, um, yeah. And, with, and you have to learn it in school and you have to study it and pass it all the way up to 18 when you leave secondary school. It's just, it's one of the subjects you have to do. When you're in school, most people hate it. Then when the kids were younger, we sent them to a whale skull. So all the way up until 12, it was immersion Irish. And then oh, wow. um, the oldest two opted to go to um, an Irish secondary school as well. So they did Irish and they did their final exam in Irish. My second guy um, did his final exam in Irish. Um, and as your kids are younger, I changed the whole attitude towards Irish. It was for going from kind of really adversarial and like, I'm not going to speak out there, you know, where you have to learn it to suddenly I'm like, I better put on, you know, be kind of good because my kids need to see me show uh, an ability to speak in Irish and learn Irish again. And I realized that I had so much stuff stuffed in my head. And like, like my youngest still kind of plays the game is he'll throw a word. I was like, tell me that word in Irish. And I won't think it, it'll come my mouth, my mouth. And I'm like, how did I know? I like stuff that I don't even conscious, I'm not even consciously aware of will just kind of come out. It's weird. <laughs> yeah, that's so interesting. I never thought of, you know, I would have thought, oh, everyone, ha you know, really wants to make sure that that language stays alive. And that it's hated by school kids, hated really? because it's compulsory and it's taught as though it's a first language and it's not. So it's not conversational. It's not, it, they need to change. There's a, there's a very big argument here over, they need to change the curriculum and they need to accept that it's not the first language. It is a second language and it should be thought as such. So it should be about conversation. It should be about keeping it alive as opposed to this make-believe fantasy that it's, you know, that it's the first language in Ireland. Because Ireland, Irish and English are given equal weight in, in, um, in Ireland. So everything has to, uh, like from a, any public documents that come out, any information that's sent out has to be sent out in both languages. Like but in, I don't like know anyone out French. Hmm? Like in, in Montreal with with uh, in yeah. Canada uh, with French. Yeah, but I think that people probably have a better relationship with French because it's a, more of a living language. There's only very yeah. small pockets in Ireland where it's still spoken naturally and they're getting smaller, you know. Um, 
Yeah, when we were in the West, I mean, again, this was a long time ago, but the first time I ever went to Ireland, it was, I flew into Dublin and, um, I, you know, I drove down the coast, I did Wicklow and Wexlow and Waterford and uh, over to uh, Kilkenny and, um, and, then, and then shot back up, but I never, I, I, I didn't go West. And the mm-hmm. second time with my husband, uh, we did fly into Dublin, we hung in Dublin, but then we shoom, went, went to, uh, I wanted to do all, the, all my sheepy tourism. So we went to Linan, so we could go to the Linan Sheep and Wool Museum, and we went to Galway, and you know, we went to the Aran Islands and all that. And I did find it uh, m- um, more people in the West yeah. than, than when I was in the East. It seemed yeah, yeah. more of a living language when I was in the West. I don't know. Yeah, if that's I think so because yeah, because along there, there's what you call Gwiltoks kind of scattered along, and they would be kind of protected areas, and they get preferential treatment as well, and a lot of grants and things to try and help keep the mm. language alive in those areas, and like all of the signage in those particular areas would be in Irish, um, and yeah, yeah, which is a little confusing as a tourist, I would imagine going through. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now, I speaking of the West, I, I want to ask you about, because um, this was a long time ago, how knitting uh, and yarn you think has changed, because my big shock, this was, um, I would say, maybe a decade ago or more when we mm-hmm. made this trip. And uh, first of all, in Dublin, there was one yarn store, just one, and it had very pedestrian selection that I could find in the States. It was Noro and Rowan. And um, then we drove to the West and we're surrounded by sheep, but all the sheep were, were, the fleeces were marked. So I could tell they were for meat, Mm -hmm. not for fleece. And when I went to the Leonan Sheep and Wool Museum, I asked the woman, I said, I couldn't help noticing that there's not a lot of yarn stores and the sheep here seem to be for meat. So which, which comes first? Is there a lack of demand? Is that why there's not supply? And she thought for a while, and I, like I said, this is about 10 or 12 years ago. And she said, can you think of something in America that uh, equals po- an act that equals poverty to you? And I thought about it and I was like, I don't know, a, you know, sharecropping I don't you know I didn't know what to say and she said now can you imagine doing that as a hobby Mm -hmm. and what was interesting is she said that the famine and and it it may seem long ago but it's not it doesn't feel that way to those that live in the west and she Mm -hmm. said that in her opinion they were a good decade or so away and I it was a decade or so from um, people's opinions about spinning and knitting being recreational. And mm-hmm. she said the younger, it's starting to happen with the younger people, but her, her um, theory. Generation, yeah. Yeah, her theory was that, that the, the ultimate in having made it is having a store-bought sweater not yep. having to spin yeah. and die. Well, like, like for instance, like all of my, I think she was actually probably spot on. And it was the same, like there's, because a lot of things in Ireland were about escaping poverty. Like people of my generation, um, like I would have come along at the start of the up, up kick in, in Ireland. So like with the results that um, any of my kids have never known anything but a boom in Ireland, not realizing that, relatives coming back from the US, every, they, you know, their clothes was were amazing, their the food there was so different. There was just enormous differences. But like that's while that's gone, I think that the view and the attitude of it's not gone. It's the same with and um, breastfeeding was the same thing. For oh, a lot yeah. of people, you would only breastfeed if you were too poor to afford um <gasps> formula. That it was like that would have gone into the same kind of bracket as as knitting. And of course it's as Edu- like and I think knitting like with breastfeeding ends up being an educational thing right. where people start explaining that yes I, you know, and and with the results that now it tends to be like people who knit and people who are breastfeeding are usually the better educated because they know the other benefits or all of the you know why you'd go for slow fashion or why you'd go for slow feeding basically <laughs> 
that but you, but it's this but it's the same reasoning behind both of them to a certain extent um which is actually really weird because i used to be a lelechi league leader years ago and so it's extra odd that somehow i've ended up as a knitwear designer so i i feel like i'm always destined to be the underdog you know <laughs> Fight, fighting a losing battle against people who think you're insane <laughs> now how do you feel about about uh, things how have things changed as far as yarn stores and popularity of knitting in Ireland like did you hit a time when, when you were an early designer where you felt like you were more popular in the states than at, in your own well home? let me even put it right now at this point 90 percent of my sales are outside of Ireland I sell and and it used to be 95 and it's only since the lockdown that there's any in Ireland people don't really want to spend money on knitting in Ireland the people who would knit a lot um, older generations they will only knit with acrylic and very 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 cheap yarn and kind of churn out baby garments and stuff like that like right. they never stop knitting but they don't necessarily have any interest in those newfangled patterns or expensive yarn. They just don't see why you do it. And in fact, when I came back, um, like my oldest, when I came, he was six, we had been living in Florida. He was born in Florida and we came back and he was 16 months old. And obviously he was freezing. It was winter in Ireland. And so I went into a yarn store and wow, I said, great. I hadn't been knitting. I hadn't knit since I was a teenager. And I said, I wanted to get some wool to knit a sweater for my son. And she looked at me and she's like, what would you want to do that for? And I said, to keep him warm. She's like, that'd be too itchy. Uh, and I'm like, don't you have soft wool? And, and she looked at me just like, well, we have merino, but she wouldn't knit a child's sweater out of merino. Like she wouldn't, she wouldn't sell me the merino to knit my son a sweater. I, I basically twisted her arm to be able to get the merino to knit him a sweater. And so if you start with that attitude, it's an uphill battle. It's just it, they people don't see the value. Like, you know, the I'm going to say old, the, the original knitting generation. It's it's in it, it's too much of a generalization because there's loads in that age group who have definitely moved with the times and are loving all of the new yarns and stuff out there. But your your standard knitter who's not online or who isn't exposed to younger knitters is still going to be there, if you know. Um, and well, there are a few for you. Sorry. How did you how did this happen for you then? How did you online? Start? I lived online. It was and I started like my first magazine, like I'm my husband's American and we lived over there, first of all, but that wasn't when I was knitting. My first pattern was a knitty. My first um, a printed magazine publish was an interweave. Um, I'm basically a US designer. I just happened to be living in Ireland because I, like I write patterns for Amer American magazines. I didn't even it, I didn't even have one in a UK magazine until I was designing for several years. My two books are published in the US. Uh, it's like I am not. I'm an Irish designer only by virtue of where I'm living. <laughs> I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I'm purely oh, export. <laughs> wow. Although yeah. you do, you, you, you work in my, uh, one of my two bucket list shows um, uh, at Royal Yarn Festival and Woolen. Those are my, those yes. are my two, those are my two bucket lists that someday I wish to be noticed by them and be hired. But I think what I've decided to do um, is not, I think the the pandemic in part has, you know, changed a lot of our thinking as far as like not waiting for things in no time. I'm not going to, if I've always wanted to go to those shows, I'm not going to wait to be hired to go to those shows. I'm going to go to those shows as a knitter. Yeah. I'm going to take classes. I'm going to go to the market. I'm going to enjoy myself. I think the reality is as well that as a U.S. designer coming over, by the time everything's paid, you're at most going to cover, you're just going to really cover costs. You're not really going to make much. And so you might as well go and just accept that and enjoy your time and make it your time. You know, right. it's, Although I mean, I did that the last time. Sorry. I'd be fine with that because then I could deduct the airfare. But anyway. Yeah. But like the last show I did was the first one I did just for myself, which was Vogue Live last January. That was the last travel I've done yeah. uh, pre-pandemic. And that was just for me because I didn't, I was kind of looking at it and I kind of thinking about taking a stand, but it's it's really expensive. And I, and I'm, 
And so I just really kind of wanted to go over and experience it. And so, it, but it was along the same lines. It was yeah. just, I like, I never do this. So myself and a friend went over and I did have a design on the woolen uh, townhouse yarns stand. So I kind of hung out there for a few hours and I had various people I wanted to meet and talk with. So it wasn't purely pleasure, but it was definitely a good chunk of pleasure time over there rather than work, you know? Yeah. And my husband said he would go with me. And, you know, I, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really sad about TNNA, about the loss of TNNA is huge. Cause like that story that you told about how a yarn came yeah. to be. Yeah. That's, that is the, the perfect example of what we've lost. Yeah. That the, kind ca of, the casual encounters where, which where kind of the magic stuff happens. Yes. Yeah. Like the first time I really sat at a table with, with Kay and, and Anne from, from MDK. Um, yeah. And, and me walking into your booth. Uh, I remember chatting that, about knit alarms. That, yeah. that I was drawn <laughs> by the yarn. And then yeah. I looked up and I was like, Oh, that's Carol Feller. And you said, yeah, that's my yarn. I'm like, Oh, it is. And then, you know, I asked <laughs> you all those questions about, about knit alarms and, you know, I had been such a fan of your, and that's gone. And so yeah. I think, we have to seek that out. We have to go. I, I, I wonder actually what I can kind of envision happening. And I've seen a few yarn shows doing it. And I know Woolen had been kind of playing with the idea of tacking um, an industry event before or after um, another yarn show. And it actually makes sense because if people have traveled already, it's the, the cost is much less but the problem being that you're either jittery because you're waiting for a show or you're shattered afterwards was the big it was the biggest problem it's really <laughs> it's so true after when i teach at vogue i usually do six <clears throat> classes and a lecture i used to do eight and then i was like nope I'm too old. I actually can't do that i don't have that stamina i never have anytime i've tried doing stuff like that i it's it takes more out of me than the money is worth i'll be honest with you i can't do it all it is yeah. brutal. And I need, uh, the, so the, then the day I come home, the, the, the two giant suitcases, they just sit there. Yeah. And I'm comatose. It generally takes me about three days to unpack and about five days before I will speak to another human that's not my husband. Yeah. But yeah. I, no, I, I totally feel you with that. To some, um, I must, there's over the last couple of years, of course, not this year, I had started doing uh, retreats with knitting tours in Ireland. And they're actually a lovely blend because you get to be with these people and it's slow and you're still teaching, interacting, but it's just such a different pace, just really is a pleasure. It's hard to going back to class, 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 class with a bunch of different people each time where you have to say, okay, who is everybody? What are we doing here? And then like, you're out of there a few hours later. Um, it's, it's, I, as I move on and I've got more bits and pieces I'm doing, I'm getting pickier about what I spend my time doing because I burn out very quickly. I don't actually have huge stamina. I've got like, I just, well, thyroid problem is irrelevant, but it's like, it means that I can do things if I have to, but it takes a really long time to pick up afterwards. I love talking with people, but I'm not necessarily a natural extrovert with the result that it takes a huge toll. I love it, but it, it does, it doesn't invigorate me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> do, you, do you know Bristol Ivy? Yeah. So she, she and I had this conversation once where people assume I'm an extrovert and I am so not at, yeah. at all. It, it takes, a show takes everything out of me. The funny thing about these virtual classes now is when I teach on my own platform, I record it so that the the students get a you know get a recording obviously shows can't do that because there's dealings with copyright and everything but i always have to edit the video because you know i'm like the video ends with you know thank you guys so much you did great thank you <laughs> that's the end of every video yeah i'm completely exhausted yeah. Um, yeah. And, and Bristol said like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a, what'd she say? Like I'm a feral cat. She called herself. Yeah. And, and and, but I mean, I've actually, cause I, I guess actually with kids and, and looking at this and looking at different personalities, 
I think it's it's probably necessary because I probably analyze things too much, but I don't think you can design without being uh, to a certain extent an introvert because you have to enjoy that quiet space and sitting down and actually working through the problem by yourself because you can't do that in extrovert mode. It doesn't happen. It's a totally different mindset. But then the teaching, because you know what you're talking about and you're feeling confident about it, it's more like putting on a show. It's always feels like it's a performance. It's you're acting, you're enjoying it. And it's fun. I loved acting when I was a teenager, but it's not necessarily the full range of your personality because it's a facet of it that you can put on, but that it's not you all the time. But I mean, the reason I think about yeah. this is because one of my kids is a gymnast and he's a very good gymnast, but he, um, like he had been on the national squad for several years. Whoa. And, but I think part of that is that he's a very, very, he was at that point, at least very shy individual and he lived in his own head. And so he could train and train and train and he trained for himself, not for anyone else. And the only way he could handle the competitions was to shut everything else out and basically perform for himself. So, but I think that most, and I think most performers, particularly elite level athletes, it requires such an enormous amount of hours training by yourself that I think you have to be at heart an introvert to be able to handle that time and to be able to go inside yourself to be able to do that, but yet still put on a show when you need to, because you have to be able to share whatever you've done with the rest of the world. And as I said, I spend way too much time thinking about this stuff. (laughs) And you have, and you have to be able to share, which means uh, if you're sick, if you are feeling low, because for whatever reason, you know, you're depressed or, or you got some bad news or, you know, someone mm-hmm. in your family is going through something uh, that's irrelevant. Yep. You have to just, you know, turn it on and yep. be there because these people have chosen to spend their money and their time and their talents with you, mm-hmm. which is a huge commitment. I mean, yep. that is, I'm, we're responsible for giving them something when they've, it's such a gift that Mm -hmm. you have all these classes to choose from and someone chooses you, Yeah, you know? So it feels like, uh, yeah, it feels like a big gift. Yeah. Um, Yeah. It is. um, I, I, some, I often try not to think about it too much because it just kind of fries my brain, you know, (laughs) you'll end up becoming like a deer in the headlines. Like, I don't know if I can do it. Like, so it's like, I just, I'll just ignore that and put it to the side and just do the best you can. <laughs> yeah. Now I want to ask you about an, um, an Instagram video I saw today, uh, which I don't think you shot today. I think it was a couple of days ago, but it, all these new colors that her, had arrived and yes. you show, you were showing um, all this empty shelving. And it, so where is that? Is that, do you have a retail space? Kind of. Well, what, what ended up happening is I grew out of the house a few years ago. Once I started set, doing the new yarn, I, originally I started in our house, then I moved to the garage next door. And then about three and a half years ago, I moved to a studio space that had a little storage corner in it. But I about last October, I outgrew it. So I've moved into, um, I, it's kind of, it's like, it's a studio come recording, come retail storage space. Cause it's basically in an industrial unit, but it's up, I'm upstairs here now and it's got huge, big high windows behind me. So like this corner here is recording. And then the other end is my kind of office space. And then downstairs, because there was a lot of space there. I'm kind of starting to set it up as retail, but like all re- all non-essential retail is shut here. So I basically uh, haven't been open since since I moved in in October. Um, so I've no idea if it's going to become a shop as such, but it's not like very extensive. It's more, know. it was just more that I'm like, let's put a bit of color up here. <laughs> It's really exciting though. Like- I, it's fun. It is. I'm really enjoying it. So it's, it's one of the, it's probably the most recent iteration because like while you saw the newer yarn, I don't, have you tried the one that I've started with Donegal yarns last no, year? No, no, no. I know I, I haven't. Yeah. And it's, and it kind I of really tied with the that. whole stories you're talking about with Irish yarn and sheep because Chris from Donegal yarns, I've been talking with him for like for 
ever. And I never, I could never figure out how to fit in doing a yarn with him because their minimums were very high. I didn't have any storage. And I'm like, this just, there's just no way I can make this work. And every now and again, he'd send me something new they were working on. I'm like, eh, it's not quite right. And then a couple of years ago, he sent on, he, he was, I said, look, I'm thinking about doing a club, would love to do some yarn. He said, I might have something that'll work. So they're doing this yarn that is 60% Irish fleece um, and 40% imported fleece. And it, it's like the original they had done was a three ply, so kind of like a heavy iron weight. But I like I, to me, it was like I wouldn't use that often, it was a bit heavy. But he said, we can do it in as many plies as you want. So we started playing with two ply, which ends up like a light worsted DK weight. And it was lovely. It was really nice to knit with. And so the the yarn Blasta ended up getting born, which in, it means uh, tasty in Irish is Blasta. Ooh. Okay. Now, yeah, now I have to see that. Um, you know, the thing you said about sport, I totally forgot that. Do you ever hear the, the, uh, the podcast cast on with Brenda I've, Dane? I haven't listened to it. No, it, it was an old podcast and then it was off the air for years. And then she just brought it back. I completely forgot. She's an American who moved to Wales hmm. and she used to complain about that, that there's yeah. no such thing as sport weight. And it was yeah. the first time I had heard that. Um, yeah, no, for what it's just not a yarn, it's an American yarn weight. Now, sometimes DK weights here are a little bit fluffy, and the light DKs are effectively sports, <laughs> right? I mean, we have a lot of crossover that, that's why, like in the gauge class, I explain you know, don't worry about names because it could be like light worsted, could yeah. be somebody else's DK. I know, and, but then you then you move into yeah. how it's spun and it's totally different again. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, don't judge a yarn until you knit it. <laughs> well, like the I uh, for Gramercy Park, I was just shooting these videos and these two yarns, exactly the same gauge on the ball band, but they're, they knit up wildly differently because yeah. one is 200 yards per 50 gram ball and one is 137 yards per 50 gram ball totally different density yeah. and ball bands are liars yep ball and, bands well, are just I, I remember somebody talking to me who used to work for um for a very big yarn name in the uk and about the fact that they the actual information and the name they give to the yarn is somewhat irrelevant they just squeeze it into whatever category they want it to be on you know <laughs> totally and because i used to work for a very big yarn company in america and not only um does it have to fit in buckets meaning like an indie spinner or a small yarn company could publish a ball band that said 23 stitches in four inches, 10 centimeters. Mm -hmm. But, a, but a, a larger company is like, no, it's gotta be 22 or it's gotta be 24. Yeah. So they cram it one way or the other. Yeah. That's yeah. A. when it doesn't really want to be there. Yeah. And B, when a mill goes out of business and it's a yarn line that's been with that company for a long time and this happened, they get another mill to make it and it comes out a little different. Mm -hmm. Well, there's already a million patterns written for that yarn. Yeah. So they just call it the same gauge on the ball band when it is so totally not. So ball bands are big, yeah. smelly liars. Yeah. Um, and I mean, the, the one that I find fascinating is that um, different colors sometimes have different weights. Have you discovered that? It's the oh weirdest thing. God, <laughs> yes. Oh my God. Yes. A, a designer that I will not out um, had that issue. He was doing a, a pattern for Vogue. And he swatched because uh, like, oh, I want to get a, a jump on it. Cause you know, Vogue is, is such a tight turnaround, right? It's like 21 days from the time they order the yarn to the time <laughs> you have to get the pattern back to them. So he was like, oh, I have a ball. I'll get a jump on swatching so I can write the pattern. Yeah. Then the yarn arrived. He sent it to his sample knitter along with the pattern. It was a different color. And the sample knitter was like, I normally you know, you and I normally knit the same and I can get your gauge. I cannot get that gauge. And he's like, really? And yeah, this is the die. Yeah. yeah. It's the weirdest thing. I, it's, yeah. I'd love, I'd love to actually pin someone from a mill down and ask them about this. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's why um, some yarn companies like Northlight Fibers, they, I'm trying, I want to make sure I say it right. It's that, um, oh, I know what it is. I asked 
there was a yarn and it had the 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 yardage meters on it mm -hmm. but it didn't say on the ball band i think this was north light fibers sven if you're watching and i'm not i'm wrong don't kill me but it didn't have grams ounces and it's because they need the yardage to be the same for yeah. every ball so that yeah. you know i'm getting the but the different colors ah. made different amounts. Yeah. So the weight is irrelevant. Yeah. Which was so yeah. interesting. That's no, that makes total sense. Cause, cause of course it's not like the mill is going to weigh each one, but they they know exactly how many times it's going to spin around. So they, they can measure yardage very easily. So everything has to be done by yardage. So right. I suspect that's why as well, you know, when you, people are looking at the weights and they weigh it and they say, oh, it's five grams shorter. I said, but it should probably still be the same actual length, physical length, if you want to go measure it out. <laughs> right. That's also why I say like, don't get mad if there's a knot in your yarn be happy that there's a knot in your yarn because they're not, the mill's not shorting you. So <laughs> breaks happen from the mill, breaks happen and yeah. you tie on and continue. What I, what bums me out is that knitters have been so upset about knots in their yarn that it's forced the industry towards something that I do not agree with, which is air splicing. Air spli I, I wanna see where the break is Oh, mm -hmm. there's a knot. Great. I'll untie it. I'll join it like a new ball. Air splicing. And don't get Clara Parks ever started on an air splice. She will go. <laughs> now you can't see where the break is. And it's not as stable. So yeah. we've harmed our own yarn because we've made such a stink over knots. Like yeah. it's, it's a fault of the yarn. It's not a fault of the yarn. I have no, if I have 10 to 12 knots in a 50 gram ball. Okay. Something's wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What four, three? No, nothing's wrong. Yeah, yeah. To sell, well, I'm I'm seeing a little bit more of the other end of it now as well. Um, selling yarn. I'm 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 getting another whole series of questions. I think I'm going to need a customer service person one of these days before I explode. <laughs> well, uh, I I highly recommend um, form emails. I'm a fan of that. Like I have certain set emails that I just cut and paste, cut and paste. Because I really have a helps. couple of those. I do yeah. have a few of those for sure. It's it saves your sanity. Oh yeah, we have a fan of um of uh uh really love Blasta Irish and New Zealand yarn hits home for me and my family. Ah, Aww, excellent. So sweet. Um, yeah, it uh, it uh uh it's so interesting. Different dyes affect gauge. Yeah. Someone, yeah. someone commented, well, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's already past an hour. I could talk to you forever. Um, Patty, I should say have... as well, if you do want to try Blasta, let me know oh, and do. I'll send a skein on to you. Just send me on a message and, uh, and uh, I'd love, uh, yeah, try it out. I actually really do. I was going to say, do you have, is that yarn in the background there? Yeah, this one is, this is Nua and this one, uh, this sweater over here is made in Blasta. Um, just in case anyone hadn't seen your beautiful yarns. And I always put notes um, under the, the video so people can find everything. So your website is your main hub for everything, right? People can find your patterns, your, your, your yarn, your classes, your kits. They can find everything. They can find Instagram. They can find every, everything. Stolenstitches.com. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to put that because by the way, I'll tell you another favorite video that, that you posted years ago on Instagram. It was my favorite. If I said wooden table with a hole in it, does that mean? <laughs> I assume you're talking about my ginger kitten, right? <laughs> Explain. Yeah, we've got a little a coffee table in 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 our hall, which was a kind of a natural slab of wood, which came with a knot that created a hole in it. We've got this itty bitty ginger kitten who loved sitting on the table, but he'd sit and he'd stick his paw right down underneath. And in fact, half the time when he'd do that, uh, the other kitten would go underneath. So they're playing through the table and the, the time. <laughs> I've still even got a photograph because we have on our home on uh, the Chromecast, uh, just a set of kitten photographs. And there's just one from, he's like three, four years old now, so a huge ginger cat. There's just one of his little ginger butt sitting up with his, his paw stuck down here like this. So I see it 
pretty much every night. So, but do you remember if that's not the video was was it a different video then? It was you trying to take a photograph oh. of a shawl that you had draped over that table, and you gave up, and you shot this video saying, "This is why I I have to give up." So you see a shawl, and then you. It, I it's a, forgotten that it's a, it was my favorite video. If the cat paw <laughs> keeps shoving through the hole, and you're like, "This is why I cannot." Stay. I've totally forgotten that I need to go see, go dig back and find it again. It was I, so funny. <laughs> you, that you, you were like, "I I can't. I give up." Oh my god! It was my favorite video ever. It was genius. <laughs> K- kitten oh. bloopers are the best. Oh, the best. Well, thank you so much. I love everything you do. I love your yarn. I love your patterns. I, I, and, and everyone that um, knits with me knows that I often refer to people to you because when um, people are looking at a design, you know, maybe of mine that is like in a, like Costa Maya, which was a very slippery, slinky nylon rayon or like a cotton designer, you know, and they want to, uh, take a seamed garment and convert it to in the round. I always say, you know, there, there's a couple incredibly skilled designers. And I always mention you and, and Coco Knits where designing something that is meant to be worked seamlessly. Every decision has been made by that skilled designer from the fiber content to the construction, to, to, to the depth of the neck, everything to make sure that works seamlessly and it holds its shape. That's very different than taking something that was designed to be seamed and then just going, I'll just remove the seams. So I always say like, if you want an excellent seamless design and you're, the the two of you are the ones that I always um, recommend that people go to because- Oh, thank you, (laughs) Patty. Because you put, I know how much thought you put into it. It's not just like, oh, I'll knit this thing, but I'll just eliminate the seams. It's hard. It uh, yeah, particularly the pattern writing, as we were saying, definitely takes a lot longer because it's yeah, because you're trying to do, you're trying to kind of compile several different things all into one thing at once. So it's it definitely you're. I often find myself sitting here and going, like, why am I making this so hard for myself? <laughs> well, and thinking through the construction and the fiber, like yeah, you're you knit with fibers that have memory yeah that will hold that the columns of stitches grip you mentioned superwash merino yeah well superwash merino it doesn't work very well with seamless unless you're going for something oversized and drapey you know because that it does that really well (laughs) right so anyway i i just always i i i hope that i've i have peeled back the curtain a little bit for people to understand how much thought goes in to what you, you know, to, well, I mean, for seamed garments too, I give thought to what the fibers and what the construction, but um, yeah, anyway, I just love Different considerations, yeah. So we have a, we have a goodbye that we always say, and because there's a 30 second delay, I always give the folks time, here it comes, so they can type it in um, as we go. But uh, this all started, over a year ago now, um, <laughs> March 17th was when I went into quarantine and I turned on the camera to chat with people and I called it quarantine live, uh, who knew that a year later I would still be doing these Here things, but, um, we have a, we have a, a goodbye that we say to each other so that we keep each other safe and it has evolved. I've added two more things It's evolved over this year and it has evolved to wash your hands don't touch your face, wear a mask, get your vaccine, knit on. So (laughs) thank you so much for spending some time with us. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be on here. Thank you for asking me. Oh, thank you. All right, you guys. Bye.